It's 2020 and currently the world is experiencing a crisis like never seen before. The coronavirus has rapidly spread across the globe, collapsing industries, hospitalising thousands of people and resulting in many fatalities. It is now that we've decided to start the SCARDI podcast to help those in the financial services navigate this very uncertain future. In this week's episode, we talk to Steve Elam, partner at Cook, Young and Keaton, a boutique firm of commercial disputes lawyers. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. Good evening, this is the, uh, the next ep- episode of the SCARDI podcast. Um, today we are joined by Stephen Elam, who is a partner with uh, Cook, Young and Keaton. Um, Steve, what are your specialist areas? My specialist areas are um, financial litigation uh, and sort of contentious regulatory issues. All right, sort of contentious regulatory advice, I suppose, as well. Um, We've obviously got um, quite uh, an interesting situation at the moment. Obviously, we're all living with the, uh, the, the fallout of the coronavirus and, and so on and so forth. How has that affected um, the field of litigation at the moment, particularly financial litigation? I think it's affected in a, in a couple of ways. Um, in, in the medium to long term, um, we're almost certainly going to be uh, relatively busy. Um, our world is probably like most of the commercial disputes world in that um, it's generally a, a counter cyclical place. So where we have a downturn, that tends to uh, result in more disputes. So we're thinking we'll be quite uh, quite busy in the in the medium term. I suppose in the short term, the the whole COVID situation is still working its way through. Um, we're seeing some disputes arising already, um, but equally, as you'll know, this is um, it's a real cash crisis at the moment, um, and I think that's really having a bit of an impact on business decision making too. And um, Frankly, litigation is expensive, so I think there are plenty of businesses at the moment where they're seeing litigation on the horizon in the future, potentially quite business critical litigation because there's a lot of businesses in difficulty at the moment. Um, and they may have to bring claims to try and rescue their businesses, make sure the businesses survive. Um, but they're, they're not sort of undertakings you want to uh, get involved in on a, on a whim. Um, it's expensive. And, and high stakes business. So, in terms of in terms of the the activity that was occurring before the crisis, so I guess cases that you've been looking at towards the beginning of the year, um, you know, obviously not related to the virus, but some other dispute. What happened to those? Have those carried on as normal, or have you seen a pause in that activity? What's the landscape like out there at the moment in those kind of cases? The landscape for those cases is they're all continuing uh, as before. Um, which is which is good. I think it's a concern that uh, any case that was ongoing uh, through the High Court in London would be stymied really by the potential inability of the courts to grapple with COVID. Um, but that's actually been, I think, a real a real plus point. Um, the sort of judiciary in the court system has actually um, adapted very well, and um, we're all very very quickly finding that virtual hearings are a new normal um, and things that work surprisingly surprisingly well um, which is a real a real positive I mean I have to admit I think I'm probably not the only litigator that was a little bit cynical as to how that would work and I was fearing that all of the ongoing cases would suddenly be delayed by three six nine months which um, if it means trial dates moving can be really quite disastrous for, for clients um, so so far that's been avoided I mean there have been some delays and certainly some court dates are moving moving off but um, for the most part no things are things are continuing as before um, just with everybody doing it remotely which is um, which is great I'd say it's probably the, the new cases that are the ones that um, are the slightly slower burn because yeah you need that initial commitment to, to really devote to it and frankly you know plenty of businesses have got other other pressures at the moment it, it is an interesting cycle, isn't it? Because obviously you mentioned that, you know, litigation is an expensive business and, and obviously, uh, you know, hiring a, a man of your calibre, I'm sure, is, is worth every penny. But there's obviously other secondary costs such as uh, as experts and so on and so forth. Um, so it is an expensive business. I mean, thinking back, um, 
you know, since the time that scardi has been operating, I think the, the one sort of noticeable um, halt, I guess, or, or change in our, our flow of expert uh, witness business was during um, the Bre- was after the Brexit vote, the very first vote, when the country voted to leave. And I think that uncertainty, um, what we saw was um, a number of cases that, that we were looking at just moved to, um, to be settled. And I guess the way we kind of thought of that was people just thinking, I've got so much else to look at. Maybe if we just sort this one out, put it to one side, settle it down, um, then we can get on with other business. And I wonder, is, is that happened in this scenario? Have you seen an increase in people moving to settle stuff so that they can concentrate on other things or not so much? No, not so much as yet. Uh, it's probably a little bit too early to really see um, uh, to see if that, that actually is an effect of what we're all experiencing at the moment. Um, I think that one, that's one of those features that will take some time to filter through. Uh, I think the reality is in most sizable pieces of litigation, the process of moving from um, you know, all out aggressive litigation to settlement discussions to resolving something, um, it can take quite a bit of time, a number of months. Um, I, I'm generally a sort of a series of quite carefully structured and thought through steps. So yes, there certainly will be, um, I think there'll be more of that inevitably. I, I think you'll find that there'll be certain litigants who are committed to litigation and partway through, but will obviously be in worse um, cash flow and general financial situations than they perhaps were before COVID. Um, and that will have an impact on litigation strategy and people will be looking for um, for exit routes um, along the lines you mentioned. But um, as yet, I wouldn't say I see a noticeable impact of that, but I'm sure I'm sure it will happen. Yeah. And and obviously, you know, again, you know, sorry to keep harking on about how expensive uh, litigation is and can be for people. But we, we are we are facing some something of a question over solvency in the general economy so how do you foresee that uh, you know people are going to be able to, to fund litigation where is that funding going to be coming from um at the, at the during this crisis or, or afterwards well i think um you know th- there will all be, always be sectors where the the cash and assets will be there to privately fund litigation um particularly if it's business critical then uh um a need will be found you know a way will be found to 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 fund those disputes if they're particularly critical um the other main answer to your question is litigation funding and that's a um a really increasingly important um area in um in our world um increasing numbers of disputes are backed by litigation funders and um we've seen already that many of the funders are are out there making a lot of noise very keen to um make clear that uh they're sitting on um decent amounts of cash ready to invest and deploy in litigation um, and I think they will um, have an increasingly important role in commercial disputes in London over the next well one to five to ten years um, frankly I think um, it's still a relatively young industry probably you know ten years or so and it's evolved hugely and moved very very quickly in that period of time and I think that's now uh, that's now going to continue um, I think you may well see perhaps more new entrants to the market, f- frankly, looking for um, other opportunities to try and you know, generate yield and returns in what's going to be a pretty difficult worldwide economic climate for um, an extended period of, ta- period of time. So um, I-, I think the market will continue to evolve and you know, it's inevitable. There's going to be greater numbers of um, litigants and-, and claimants who don't have the liquid assets to easily bring high value litigation so the the number of opportunities for funders to get involved is is certainly going to increase um yeah i mean that 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 is a, a very an interesting aspect i mean one often thinks as as finance and the financial markets as a place where they, they probably everyone would you know certainly wouldn't have any shortage of money but of course that can be the case but what are i mean are there situations where um claimants and litigants with you know with funds would still opt to have their case funded by a litigation funder are there reasons for that it might happen um there are uh, and that i'd say that's been an, uh, an increased focus of 
litigation funding over the last probably three or four years. Um, I think with litigation funded, uh, litigation funding started out about 10 years or so ago. Um, I did a, a funded case to trial. It was one of the probably very early ones. Um, but the sector at the outset, it was all about sort of giving access to justice for impecunious claimants and um, finding ways to let those claimants, you know, have their day in court. Whereas now it's really an exercise about, um, you know, divesting risk and um, taking things off balance sheets. Um, and for obvious reasons, post COVID, that's going to continue to be um, um, something that's going to be quite attractive to, to, to businesses to, uh, to, to do that. Um, de risk um, what's involved in getting involved in a, in a, in a sizable piece of litigation. Um, obviously, the, the downside is you give up a portion of your returns. But as, as long as the economics work uh, and the claims are sizable enough, then, um, then that's obviously a pretty powerful proposition. Um, at the moment, and so, and just explain what you, what you what you said there about um, it being an attractive proposition for people to move things off off balance sheet. Are, are you saying that um, once something is involved in, you know, whether it's a transaction or a business or part of a business is involved in a litigation, would it therefore be ring fenced and off balance sheet? Is that what you're saying? I suppose I mean in the slightly more um, the slightly more general sense that. Um, for a particular business, the the month on month um, costs of paying lawyers are effectively met by the litigation funders. So oh, I see. there's a positive um, balance sheet impact in in that way. Um, okay. Yeah, right. that's 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 as lawyers trying to talk accounting, Nick. So uh, <laughs> I was I was getting my regulatory hat on, going. This is this is a very interesting area. If all of this kind of stuff can can go on. Well, that, that's interesting, Stephen. And what, uh, I mean, are you getting any inklings now, sort of, you know, I guess sort of canary in the coal mine kind of stuff about the kinds of litigation um, that you foresee we're going to be looking at over the next few years um, as we progress through and out of this crisis, hopefully? Yeah, I think probably the way I'm looking at it so far is it falls into two camps, maybe. Um, the first is the, the short term disputes and even some of those we're seeing at the moment um, and they tend to be the um, I mean this is focusing on financial services um, obviously there's some claims getting underway in relation to business interruption insurance is a is a very high profile one in a, looking at the business world in a broader sense but focusing on financial services um, already we're seeing um, disputes arising out of late March early April market volatility um, disputes over margin calls, closeouts, um, awkward valuation issues um, in very stressed, volatile times. Um, and they, those are the sorts of disputes that arise quickly. Some of them, frankly, can disappear quite quickly too, but some of them will result in mitigation. Um, and then I suppose you have the, the slightly bigger, longer term um, second category of disputes, um, which I can see a lot of bondholder claims um there's uh there's obviously going to be a lot of corporate defaults that um we just really haven't seen yet frankly um despite the market sort of seeming quite rosy um i don't think those difficulties have really gone away and they're probably going to uh, materialize in the third and fourth quarters of this year um and that will certainly give rise to a number of issues um there's a lot, of, a lot of, just to take one example, a lot of press at the moment about hurts and, um, you know, bondholders holding what they thought was, you know, triple A rated debt um, are potentially going to see really quite severe losses. Um, and that obviously raises, uh, raises a number of questions as to how and why that's happened, who can claims be brought against. Um, there'll certainly be quite a bit in the structured world as well. Um, uh, CLOs, for example, look quite stressed at the moment, and um, it'll be interesting to see if defaults take place there, and uh, that throws up some interesting questions in terms of claims against um, uh, issuers, uh, calculation agents, uh, the whole remit uh, of parties involved in those um, in those structures, trustees as well potentially. Um, one thing I'm quite interested to see, um, will, if it will arise out of all of that, is claims against rating agencies. Um, that was a little bit of a niche thing that came up after the last financial crisis. Um, 
sort of been dealt with by regulation and those claims have been quite um, quite difficult to bring. Um, but it was quite stark sort of following the press through the early weeks of the pandemic and constantly reading about um, uh, downgrades by the rating agencies um, in really quite difficult times where you're sort of thinking, well, how, how have they come to that conclusion? Um, what data are they basing on that, that on now where there's such volatility and frankly, valuing things is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, this is obviously from the, the litigator um, from the outside looking in, but um, that's quite fascinating. It'd be interesting to see if people start to look under that bonnet and see what can be, uh, what can be done there in terms of um, uh, potential claims. Um, obviously, a lot of them will be more backward looking in terms of um, initial ratings on um, structures or bonds, for example, that really once you get, uh, get to a position of stress, um, people will think, well, how, how, could, how could you ever have come up with that, um, that rating in the first place? And those are the interesting ones because then investors are genuinely relying on those, um, those ratings to, to make their investment decisions. And that will potentially be the key to some of those claims. And, and do, you, do you get a sense um, this time around, because obviously the rating agencies were, as you say, got huge scrutiny after the last crisis, the, the 08 crisis, and, and really the main accusation there was that they were way behind the curve um, and, and really struggled to, to keep up. Uh, are, you, are you therefore feeling that they are being overly proactive in, in, their, in their actions to, to downgrade, as you said, through the volatility that was seen? Or is it a case that they're still behind the curve and, and, and in fact, the, the sort of starting place that, 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 that they came from was, the, was in the wrong place and therefore, you know, it doesn't justify where they're moving things to now? Is, which, which one are you seeing? Probably a bit of both, I think. Um... Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think the answer to the question is, is, is both. Um, the, um, the recent activity is sort of particularly interesting and you raise a good point in that there is an issue here in that these rating agencies are sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't, if they're overly proactive in uh, difficult times, um, you get people like me trying to raise eyebrows and potentially criticize them, but they'll be hit with the same criticism if they'd, uh, if they left it for a number of months, um, obviously, but you know those um, those downgrades and, and amendments to ratings obviously have really quite significant knock-on cons consequences in terms of uh, margin calls. And um, you'll remember, Nick, I in, in, my, in my days when I was uh, at MF Global, I saw that um, firsthand where we was uh, I was working for a business that was downgraded, and the uh, the impact on the business's margin requirements. Uh, with all sorts of counterparties was huge and immediate and uh, and it really had a huge knock-on impact in terms of what happened to, um, to that I mean, business. I'm not saying it was a cause obviously but it was certainly a, an interesting factor at a very difficult time. No well I, I think you know I think that it, that's an interesting point Steve you know you, you were in-house at, at MF Global a business that got into difficulty in 2011 I, I think it was I seem to remember that uh, as I think I was just still in the market active at that point uh, before moving into, into the world of SCADI and, and trying to right the world's wrongs in the financial markets. Um, but it, it, if you are at the centre of, a, of, a, of an, a situation like that, it certainly does raise your, um, your awareness, I think, and your sensitivity to something uh, or for something. Um, it, it is, I do think that this particular crisis you know, juxtaposed with the previous one and thinking with, you know, with your regulatory hat on for, for a moment, um, that there is such an interesting juxta juxtaposition because, you know, obviously 08, as we've said, there was, you know, very light, re low touch regulation, you know, the rating agencies under fire for not being proactive enough, you know, banks operating loosely, financial institutions operating quite loosely. And then come to this time around, and uh, suddenly the banks are, or certainly the, 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 the beginning of the crisis, I think, I think everyone is kind of caught up now due to government action, but they were certainly you know, under fire for being overly rigorous in their application of the rules 
Um, and certainly that was the accusation. I'm not sure they were overly rigorous. I think they were probably just, um, you know, doing, you know, uh, going through the, the, the proper practice. Um, but it's an interesting juxtaposition, isn't it, for this crisis versus the last one? Yeah, it really, it really is. Um, I mean, just go on NF Global and the NF Global days, which was 2011, as you say. So, um, what three years on from Lima at that point, and obviously some changes had taken place and some some lessons had been learned, but it was still very early days. Uh, that was the um, the first special administration in the UK, which was the kind of the insolvency uh, route whereby the FCA have a very um, focused and involved role. Um, but frankly, um, we had to look at that and try and work out how it would work. It was new to everyone. No one really had a clue. And the FCA didn't really have a clue. It, we were um, embracing it and um, getting to grips with that as we went along. Obviously, compare that to now, where we've sort of had a, a cycle of very extensive regulation for 10, uh, 10 12 years or so. Um, yeah, it, it really is um, a very, very different situation. Um, it's, it's interesting, you sort of see what's come out of the FCA since the start of the pandemic, and um, it's all sort of focused on operational resilience and actually how well that's been, been working. Um, things have functioned well, despite us all working in our spare bedrooms and um, getting to grips with, uh, with that, which I'm sure probably wouldn't have been the case um, had this happened back in 2008, it would have been um, it been really very different. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what um, what happens going forwards. I suppose sort of looking ahead, and um, uh, now we're sort of post Brexit, and what the world will be like genuinely after Brexit, when we are uh, separated from Europe, and we're going to be in a downturn. Everyone's pretty clear about that, um, and um, there's going to be um, some real pressure to try and generate economic growth again um, and I, I suppose I mean real economic growth that's not sort of artificial growth engineered by central bank stimuluses and things of that nature um, and you can see that um, there's going to be some political pressure to try and move towards lighter touch regulation again uh, to try and really help that along. Uh, I can certainly see that, that that would be the case. And I think, I think you are already getting noises uh, of that um, and certainly a, a flavour for that. And I think you're absolutely right on, you know, the, the, the political mood music um, that's out there. Are there any um, areas where you see, you know, some changes, some changes in regulation where they feel the need to strengthen? Have, have there been any anything that's come out of this situation now that it is attracting regulatory attention where they might strengthen regulations or is it generally a loosening across the board do you think well i, th I think for, for now i think the, the loosening maybe comes further down the track when political pressure holds sway and certainly if you ask anyone at the fca now they won't want to think that there's any sort of loosening of regulation um I think for now the priorities are sort of consumer protection uh, and some of the other initiatives are on the back burner a little bit while we get through this situation and um, uh, and obviously there's a real uh, well political desire and regulatory desire to ensure that consumers don't um, come out of this badly um, and before the pandemic I was doing quite a bit of work in that space involving pensions advice is sort of one example that's only going to continue because it's um, um, it's it's a it's a live issue and something that the regulator will keep working working on and working intensely on um, through the pandemic um, and and beyond um, and then probably the other um, interesting thing to see how it plays out will be we've had a, um, a movement over the last 18 months or so um, towards increased accountability of individuals um, with the regulator and, uh, uh, and and people having to take senior manager roles within regulated firms and potentially being on the hook in their individual capacities. Um, that's been live for some times in, in, in some sectors, but uh, it's, it's much newer in, in other um, non-banking sectors in particular. Uh, and you'd think that um, in, in the ordinary course, bringing those changes in, the regulator will be looking for some um, 
some early scouts and maybe some early scapegoats in terms of finding um, um, individual misconduct that they are quite keen to sort of make a make an example of to show how that new regime is going to work in practice. Um, that's going to be quite difficult in in, uh, in in practice now when, frankly, the regulators are having to be a bit more um, cautious in terms of how they approach that when everyone's grappling with that new regime, but doing so from working at home and uh, dealing with everything else that uh, that COVID has brought in terms of all other challenges to the businesses. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes, but that's certainly another, um, um, I suppose, an evolving theme in terms of what the FCA is going to be doing going forward. And, and what what are the the, the businesses that, that that's going to encompass now? Because obviously you mentioned it goes wider than just banking. Where 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 is that reach going to now? Um, increasingly wide. Um, it's probably more a case of. Um, I mean, it, it's evolving. There are, there are new um, new sectors being added to it as we go. But I think pretty much. I suppose the default is that you can sort of think that most regulated sectors that is now an issue uh, for them and they have senior managers in place with that responsibility uh, and those obligations um, so it's yeah so it's pretty much across the board um, it's a, it, there's not really very much left that doesn't fall within the scope of that uh, and and I guess sort of you know away from that I mean one uh, I think unexpected um, part of, of this crisis, which you know was an episode, was the the move to negative oil prices, which seems to have caught a number of of the brokerage houses out, particularly around their modelling, um, you know the the capability of models to to take negative prices, um, and then just on you know on the word negative again, you know there's a lot of talk of of moving to negative rates uh, and so on and so forth. So I wonder whether there might be some um, attention um, around that kind of um, impact on modelling, for example. Are, are you seeing any any potential cases relating to to what occurred um, with the with the negative oil price movement at all? Um, I wouldn't say I've personally seen um, a, a nice case on that that's come across my desk. I'd love to I'd love to see one, but um, <laughs> but no, certainly look anecdotally there that there are. Um, there will almost certainly be disputes out there around and I've sort of read about about some of them. Um, yeah, that was a pretty extraordinary situation um, and it's a pretty perfect example of um, extreme volatility um, and uh, causing, um, you know, creating risk and creating losses um, really quite quickly. Um, yeah, I think it probably wasn't, um, probably wasn't really helped by some a lot of inexperienced um, commodities investors jumping in at certain points um, in uh, in March and April, um, but but yeah, there are, and um, you can see that some of those uh, market movements, the volatility of um, uncovered frauds in other parts of the world. I think there's a big oil trading fraud in the Far East in Singapore that's been uncovered. Um, that's um, that's another good theme actually for disputes post COVID. Um, um, there's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty well known that when, when times are tough and uh, markets are volatile and difficult and we hit a downturn, then um, that really is the moment where frauds tend to be uncovered. Um, and there's no reason why this situation is going to be going to be any different, be it trading related misconduct or frankly across most business sectors. Um, I'm sure we'll see, we'll see plenty of that. And, and Steve, I mean, CYK um, really, is, as far as law firms go, it's a relatively young firm. I think you started 10 years ago. You're slightly older than, than the mighty Scardi. Um, do, are, you, are you UK focused as a business or is, is Cook, Young & Keaton uh, working overseas at the moment? Do you have cases overseas? What's your reach? We do. Our, our reach, is, um, our reach is, is pretty global. So we are, we are a UK firm. I mean, as you say, we're 10 years old. So we were... Uh... A child of the last financial crisis mm. um, and have sort of been from day one uh, doing financial disputes arising out of that and, and ironically are still doing those and even new ones are still are still coming up but in answer to your question um, 
yes, we're we're based in London, but it's um, it's a it's a it's a global reach. Um, obviously, one of the, the beauties for for us is that um, you know here in London, in the UK, we have uh, an excellent court system, um, an excellent legal system, and English law is very highly respected around the world. And um, frankly, we can have disputes in the courts in London or arbitrations um, heard in London, maybe heard elsewhere, that will be ultimately arising out of um, contractual documents, be it banking, financial or anything else, that are um, to be determined by reference to English law um, and English courts. That's still, despite Brexit, I think, and hopefully this won't change, um, you know, it's still a very respect, well-respected system that um, uh, that sort of drives commercial parties to choose English law and English courts. So that um, that drives a lot of our work, uh, and it does mean that huge amounts of it are international. Um, in right. fact, probably probably mo most of it has an international element in 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 some form or other. And um, yeah, you know, for, for law firms like ours, there's you know there's there's different ways you can do it. Obviously, there are very large firms with with offices in all corners of the world um, but um, but to the extent we need to um, work with law firms in different jurisdictions we've got you know very sort of good networks and contacts and um, increasing numbers of firms with with I suppose sort of similar similar dynamics to us uh, in terms of you know size of the business and what we're looking to do focusing in, in litigation and dispute resolution only as opposed to being a, a full a full service firm that that specialism and um is something that's quite attractive to uh, to many clients and other firms that we end up working with and and just in terms of the the sort of the the day-to-day -day working with with cyk at the moment in in the um in the crisis and i'm imagining you know you're not in your under, uh, your london offices well, i can see you're at home uh, i don't think you raced home from london to be with us i'm sure you're you're working from home now but um you know, our experiences working with, as experts is that, uh, you know, a lot of the work that you're doing is is processing, um, you know, documents online, reading through documentation, etc., contracts, whatever it happens to be. Um, have there been any particular exciting, interesting innovations, technological adoptions within law, do you think, as a result of this crisis? Um I'd say probably one of the, the best innovations is that you get uh, Luddites like me being forced to um, to read documents electronically and uh, <laughs> save some trees and um, stop getting huge uh, amounts of paperwork printed off and couriered around to my house. Uh, so I've been resisting that temptation. Um, actually, what's, in all seriousness, what's really been surprising is just how well set up everyone is to work work remotely um, yeah. I still like to see things on a piece of paper you know, as, as many people do and obviously you can you can do that from home anyway it's 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 fine um, but yeah I mean all law firms these days have got you know really quite sophisticated document management systems and we can instantly get to grips with large volumes of documents um, and work through them as teams despite individuals all being in, in different locations um, and um, yeah, I know it's a bit cliche now, but sort of everyone's talking about, you know, will this really change working practices? Um, and I think I think it genuinely will. Um, I think there will be a lot more remote working and acceptance of it. Um, that said, I'm still there. I really miss being in the city, frankly. Yeah. Um, just just the sort of the buzz of it and the ability to have face to faces with people. I can't really wait to get back to to that. Um, as much as I love having you know Zoom calls with people like you, Nick, um, I'd, ra I'd rather be sat down having a beer with you in a beer garden somewhere. That would be uh, that'd be much more. Well, possible. maybe June the twenty second, I think, is when Boris has got it all lined up for us. So, <laughs> so let's see. Well, Steve, thank you. That's been a really fascinating insight into what's happening in in law at the moment. Uh, so, thank you very very much for for being. Uh, guests on our podcast and um, yeah I look forward to that beer in the in the near future sounds good yeah no problem at all enjoyed it thank you for listening to episode five of the Scardi podcast stick with us on this journey as we like many of you are trying to navigate these very uncertain times
This is the Scardy Podcast.